Well, thank you all for coming out on such a beautiful evening. It's just a wonderful day that we've had today and a nice weekend as well. So Monday evening is this great turnout. I like to do this at some of these forums, and I'd just like to ask if there's anybody here who um, has never been in a room full of people with a spondylitis before. Wow, look at that. And I'd like to bet that um, quite a number of you have been uh, longer than five years in diagnosis. Yeah. And you thought you were alone, right? You thought you were alone with this disease and you didn't know about uh, you know, the Ontario Spondylitis Association, the Canadian Spondylitis Association, or even Spark and what they're doing for you. So you know, the message today is that you're not alone. As far as the CSA is concerned, we're here to advocate for patients and educate patients because the educated patient is somebody who uh, is obviously better informed about their disease and is going to be able to better manage it. And it's all about management, as we're going to hear from our patient speakers later on. Um, as I say, you're not alone because you can become a member of the uh, Canadian Spondylitis Association, and that's part of an international. Um, organization as well. The CSA belongs to ASIF, which is the Ankylosing Spondylitis International Federation, which covers <coughs> I don't know how many countries in the world, and of course they are members of the Intergalactic uh, Spondylitis Federation as well. So it goes on and on. You're not alone. Um, this is our website here. This is the page of our website, www.spondylitis.ca. I'm Michael Madison, and I'm president of the Canadian Spondylitis Association. And I got involved originally with the Ontario Spondylitis Association after it took two, 10 years for me to be diagnosed with this disease, during which time I went through pain and suffering and fatigue and depression and uh, you know, difficulties with family relationships that uh, I'm sure these stories are all common to you. And maybe you're hearing it for the first time, if this is the first time you've been in the room for of people who also have your disease. Um, just, before we, uh, just before I go further with the Canadian Spondylitis Association, though, I just want to let you know about two things that are in your handouts. There's a blue question slip here. So after each of the speakers, we're not going to have questions. We're going to write down your questions for the Ask the Experts um, panel at the end of this forum. And we do that for efficiency, because often several people have the same or very similar question. So if you can write out these blue slips whenever you've got a question, hand it in to anybody who's wearing one of these spark name, plate, name tags, and uh, take it from there. This is a free program, but there is a cost to get out. And the cost is to fill out one of these. It's, <laughs> it's the evaluation form. This is really important to us. It really helps us produce better forums for you in the future. And it gives you an opportunity to tell us what you think we should be including, as well as the stuff that has been included. Um, so please do that. On the back, we encourage member membership of the Canadian Spondylitis Association through our website. If you go directly to www.spondylitis.ca, um, but uh, if you wish, you can just fill out this on the back there, and when it's handed in, we'll take notes that you want to be a member. And why be a member? I think, I think I've sort of already touched on that. Um, you know, you, you, you start suffering with back pains or pains down your leg, and you go to doctors and chiropractors and physiotherapists. You, don't know what, you, you just don't know what's going on, because it may go on for years. And um, that's not a good enough. Uh, situation in my mind. I have heard that 10 years ago, the average time from onset to diagnosis was seven to eight years, and it's now down to two to three years. But personally, I still think that's pretty dreadful. It should be way, way down. Hopefully, you know, if only the healthcare professionals knew more about this disease, and you were able to advocate for yourself a bit more. We're here to help you advocate and to help others in the future so that, that wait time is drastically reduced and you can get on managing your disease properly. Because management is essential to well-being, to living a proper lifestyle, to having a pro productive life, and to maintaining posture. You'll hear from Laura Castellant, the physiotherapist this evening, and as you know, exercise is critical 
to the management of this disease. And um, it's, it's all very well to go out and uh, <coughs> cycle for a couple of miles or walk a mile or something. That's great exercise. Do it by all means. But it's not a substitute for therapeutic exercise where you have to maintain range of motion in your neck or, or, or flexibility in your legs and spine. So uh, that, I think, will be the main lesson of uh, Laura's speech. Um, just coming back to awareness, uh, there is a now free application for your iPhone or iPad. I don't have a slide in it, but it's here. It's put out by the Arthritis Consumer Experts. And their website is jointhealth.org. And you can get this on iTunes uh, store app as well. There's a self-diagnostic tool which is called Arthritis ID. And there's another one for professionals called Arthritis ID Pro. I would actually like you to mention this to your GPs and uh, other healthcare providers. Uh, I think your rheumatologist is probably pretty able to do that. But uh, certainly GPs and the first line healthcare providers if you can tell them about that and download it yourself and show it to them, it just takes you through a question tree. And in the case of ankylosing spondylitis or cervical arthritis or any of the spondylar arthritic diseases, it eventually comes down to you know, the possibility that you have this. And um, it's a great thing. Um, so that's a, a little bit more awareness. Um, that same website runs campaign called the National Arthritis Awareness Program that was done between ACE, the Arthritis Consumer Experts, and the Arthritis Society in its first year. It's now into its third year and it's got a different partner. But it's something that's very important because the common perception of arthritis, I think, is the old lady with the gnarly hands. And that is so wrong. I mean, I'm just looking at the age group here, um, I can tell that that's wrong. I mean, lots of children have arthritis, who would have thunk it? And, um, you know, uh, it, it's not good. In fact, one in six people in Canada have some form of arthritis. So why be a member of the Canadian uh, Spondylitis Association? I'll just tell you something about its history. Back in about 2005, um, when SPARC was pulled together, and SPARC is the Spondyl Arthritis Research Consortium of Canada, and it's a group of people who uh, came together as investigators to look into researching the cause and the cure for uh, spondylarthritis. <laughs> they, so they're behind you, you're not alone. Um, they recognized the need for a national organization because at that time there was the Ontario Spondylitis Association, there was the Manitoba Ankylosing Spondylitis Association, and there's an Ankylosing Spondylitis Association, BC. So, in fact, most of the country uh, wasn't covered. And uh, since then, we've made some headway in trying to cover Alberta and um, Newfoundland and Maritimes. Uh, we've made a little bit of a headway into Quebec, but there's the translation problems, etc. So anyway, Spark recognized this need for a national organization and asked my colleague, Ken Mulholland, <coughs> There he is, treasurer of the Canadian Spondylitis Association and the past president of the Ontario Spondylitis <coughs> Association, together with uh, Bruce Clark, who's the physiotherapy advisor to the BC Association, as well as being on the advisory board of the Spondylitis Association of America. So those two gentlemen were asked to seek out suitable patients who might be interested in forming a national organization. And through their hard work and the support of Spark, and eventually uh, through um, the first national uh, research initiative that was given to Spark by the Arthritis Society, <coughs> which allowed for patient forums, everything came together. Uh, so there were meetings in 2005, 2006, getting it all together. 2007, we had a one-day patient forum here in Toronto. And 2008, it was in Edmonton. In 2009, in Quebec. 2010 back in Toronto, and then this year the funding has changed a little bit, and we're very pleased that uh, Jensen has stepped forward to fund three patient forums um, this year. One of them is in Edmonton, um, the other one is in St. John's, 
and, uh, and there's this one here today. They've all taken place in September. And I don't know what it is about these forums, but I went to Edmonton expecting to wear mucklucks and parka, and it was 30 degrees and sunny there. I went to St. John's with my sou'wester, and it's 20 degrees and blue skies there. And then Toronto, it's you know, been forecasted rain, and it's been a beautiful day. So we should keep it up. Um, anyway, the forums are to educate people. And if this is the first time you've attended a forum, I really hope that you learn something out of this that will help you manage your disease. But I also hope that you will become part of the Spondylitis community by joining the CSA. You do get a, a quarterly newsletter as a member. It looks like this, eight pages. And that will be sent to you electronically these days, um, once every quarter. Um, you also get access to our website. You can see here that there's a, hmm, somewhere it says join or register now. Or already a member, log in here. So uh, you get access to back copies of the um, newsletter and uh, some other in information. We're in the process of upgrading the website and uh, I'd like to let you know that this form is being videotaped as were the previous Spark CSA forums, as was the forum in Edmonton on September the 10th, as was the forum in St. John's on September the 21st. Those have all been video videotaped and they'll all be up on the websites of the Arthritis Society, Spark, and the CSA within about three to four weeks. So look for those coming. And um, we also have a presence on uh, Facebook. So if you want to start a chat or anything on Facebook, um, that's where you can go. It's just Canadian Spondylitis Association, it's the name of the group. Um, we'll go back to the, the key in there. I think, it, I think it's important to become a member of the community. And um, why I think that's important is that there is an unequal uh, access to medications across this country. It's, it's quite insane in some ways that we've got 11 or 12 or 13 different jurisdictions across the country ruling on whether a particular biologic is eligible for funding for the treatment of ankylosing spondylitis. In 2008, when we were in Edmonton, um, there, was a, there was a big effort, advocacy effort going on to allow some of the uh, biologics to be admitted um, for funding. And uh, the CSA was a small part of that huge advocacy effort. But you know what? It paid off. Um, about six months after the forum, the Alberta government backed down and said, yes, they would fund these drugs for biologic drugs uh, for ankylosing spondylitis. And that made a whole lot of sense to us. Because you know, why have somebody at home, perhaps bedridden, certainly not working, probably on welfare, when uh, you know, for the sake of $20,000 a year in drugs, you can be active, you can be uh, out there earning money and paying taxes and enjoying life. So I think it's important to join the community to advocate. I think it's important to join the community in order to uh, uh, spread the knowledge about the disease, not only to other people who have it, you lot, uh, but also to healthcare providers who just at this moment don't know enough about it. And some of the GPs are the first to admit they don't. They have very little background on rheumatology uh, during their medical school years, and they've probably not been faced with it. And when they are faced with it, most people who present with lower back pain will have mechanical back pain. You know, it's only, we don't know, half of 1% or 1% of the population uh, who have ankylosing spondylitis. It used to be thought that it was a male disease. We now know that that's not true. It's, it's much closer to 50-50 male-female than it was thought to be um, 10, 15 years ago. So I, I think you know, it's, it's important to educate as well as advocate for patients. There's a third reason I think you should become a member and why I'm a member. We are the patient side, if you like, of SPARC. These are brilliant individuals 
Robin Mann, Dr. Robin Mann is speaking after me. He's a foremost expert, not just in Canada, but in the world on your disease. We're hugely privileged to listen to him. But he needs patients from time to time to answer questionnaires on the uh, course of the disease or to take blood samples or what have you. We'd like to be able to um, deliver patients to uh, allow that research to go forward so that you know, our children and their children don't have to suffer from that, uh, the same condition. Um, okay, I think I pretty well said what I want to say, and I've ran them on, but um, I think I really have covered everything. The most important message though is just to fill out that evaluation form at the end of the forum, please, and get it to us. Okay, I'm not going to say very much about uh, Robin, and he's got a lot of um, uh, well, titles and honours, etc. Uh, but suffice it to say that we are really privileged to have him here. He is a foremost expert on spondyl arthritis. Dr. Thank you, okay. uh, Thanks a lot, Michael. Um, I think that, just, uh, just to reiterate, um, that this evening really is about partnerships. Um, First off, as uh, Michael said, the, uh, the, the partnership with Janssen, and I'd like to thank Greg and John and Christina Curl from Janssen for supporting these uh, patient forms that have gone across Canada, which is great. It's, this is a distinctive, a great Canadian exercise. We're very excited about that. Uh, the second uh, important uh, partnership is with the Arthritis Society, and Alan Overton and Pippa Shattuck and Sandra Dow is here as well. So. <laughs> Thank you for coming. And of course, the most important partnership uh, of all is with uh, you, the patients. Uh, for those of us who are involved with uh, the care of this disease and also researching the disease, uh, this is what, uh, what it's all about. And it's important that we take every opportunity to share our thoughts uh, together. Just back up here. Uh, that could be. Uh, okay. uh, So, uh, to, just to begin on this uh, exercise, and I need a, uh, my, uh, uh, so this is very much a work in progress. As uh, Michael said, we'd like to hold the questions till after, but we really encourage and you, if there's something you'd like to follow up on in the question period, something objectionable, you can certainly throw something at me. But otherwise, uh, just make a note of it and we'll save it. Because uh, this is really all about a dialogue. In fact, the setting our research agenda is very much working uh, with our patients, as you know. So this is a work in progress. Earlier diagnosis and better treatment is what uh, our program is really all about. And um, just about every aspect of our daily lives regardless of what profession you pursue, is influenced by back pain. And back pain and stiffness and fatigue that accompanies ankylosing and spondylitis, uh, as uh, you well know, is a major impact on the uh, activities of daily life and certainly employment. I'll start with some of the, the classical uh, teachings about the disease and then I'll look at some of the developments and how our thinking may be actually changing. So if, if you open a textbook or go to the websites, um, when we think about the characteristics of pain that occurs in AS, it's generally a younger population in, in whom the pain starts gradually. Uh, we've had many patients, and some may be here tonight, whose disease seemed to start very abruptly, even with, an, uh, with a traumatic event, uh, which is important to figure into this dynamic, too. It's chronic. That's uh, to distinguish it from many other causes of back pain. And it's distinctively associated with very significant stiffness in the morning, which generally uh, and ideally would improve with exercise. Uh, this data is actually based on a large survey we did in North America, about 2,500 AS patients, just to give you an idea of the spread of the uh, onset of symptoms. So this is the age at which uh, the, the uh, patients started their first experience their, their symptoms, and primarily that is uh, stiffness and pain in the low back. Uh, you can see the spread here. You know, the bulk of the patients really are between 18 and uh, uh, mid 40s, and that's so that's an important dynamic uh, in terms of uh, educating our doctors to be alert to this disease. Um, I'll draw attention to this interesting group. So almost almost 20% of our patients at Toronto Western 
have onset of their disease under age 18. So they're seen by my colleague Shirley C. in the Spondylitis Clinic at Hospital for Special Sur uh, I'm sorry, Hospital for Sick Children, and, um, and then they graduate, right? And so when you, if you're a patient at sick kids, when you hit about your 17th birthday, they give you an exit ticket out of the hospitals. Now, happily, we've got a very close relationship with that program. So the patients that are, whose uh, spondylitis starts in their teenage years move over to our uh, program at the Western, and uh, we and surely share a common uh, database. So we've uh, managed to capture and follow these uh, young patients, uh, often in their high school and their university years um, through the time. When we did the survey, we asked the patients, so, so tell us what actually really troubles you. And you can see that by what far away the dominant symptoms we heard from the patients were back pain and stiffness and neck pain and stiffness. Uh, stiffness other than uh, joints and neck, this is a very important issue, particularly with hip disease and shoulder disease. Uh, rib cage and sternum pain, which is quite distinctive. There aren't many other forms of arthritis that uh, really affect rib cage so distinctly. And if anybody needs, uh, if any patients need a real hug, it's a edge patient, but it really hurts, right? When you get a, uh, if you've got active sternal pain. Uh, almost 30% of our patients have intermittent eye inflammation called iritis or uveitis. Uh, so we commonly follow uh, very actively with our ophthalmologists at, Tr at Toronto Western Hospital. And heel pain is quite distinctive as well, uh, getting up first thing in the morning, unable to put your foot down. It, it, when we did this survey with our patients, as you can see, um, there isn't a single really aspect of uh, re either recreational activity or professional work that's not profoundly influenced from by ankylosis spondylitis. It really impacts just about every aspect of uh, life, whether um, and impacts quality of life by uh, any definition. And this is really the, the challenge that we and the you as, the, as patients face. And every aspect, this is what's called uh, uh, SF36, when we do questionnaires about how pa patients are really coping with their disease, you can see once again whether the, it's the physical response to the disease, the emotional response, the social impact of the overall scores, uh, this is, really does change uh, the day-to-day -day life of just about every patient affected with AS. We're working with a, a very strong group at Toronto Western Hospital with uh, Lisa Badley and uh, Aileen Davis, uh, that are epidemiologists uh, trained to think uh, how to measure these in a very rigorous manner. This is actually comes from a World Health Organization grid. Um, and it begins to put into a, a structured format how we can actually relate very different parts of the disease. So, for example, the, uh, the, in the, our lab at the Western is very interested in the genetic and molecular aspects of the disease. But then our, all the way over to the other side with our epidemiology group, they're measuring uh, how uh, Im impact on employability and income status and uh, uh, your activities in the workplace actually make a big difference. So we're very fortunate at the Western to have a multidisciplinary team that actually can bring some uh, rigorous measures to these very important uh, quality of life indicators. That's part of our activity. This data actually came from our questionnaire of 2,500 AS patients. Um, and so the, the Michael alluded to this. This is a, has been and really continues to be a significant challenge. So if you draw the line here, here's about 50% of our patients. Uh, and 50% of patients uh, have um, more than five years of symptoms before the diagnosis is made. Okay? So for those five years, and sometimes five to 15 years, uh, the patients are seen by chiropractors and massage therapists and uh, psychiatrists and all manner of different disciplines. And this is a challenge for us, I think, in the medical community in terms of doing better. This is really a challenge for us to shorten this time of diagnosis, which is really unacceptable from our point of view. And I'm sure certainly it's unacceptable from yours as well. And Nelson Stone, who worked with us, is now back, heads up the spondylitis program in Bath, England, uh, showed that actually this makes a difference. That the, this delay in diagnosis is not just an, doesn't impose uh, this unnecessary and hopefully avoidable suffering on patients, but it actually delays functional outcomes. So we are, this is another imperative for us to in, uh, make a diagnosis more effectively earlier and intervene in this disease. 
So this is the kind of algorithm that we, we work with with our uh, primary care physicians. So uh, one aspect for a busy fam family doctor is giving him the skills to discriminate of all the patients that come into his office with back pain. How can he be alert to those, those that percentage of patients that actually have spondylitis? Because early diagnosis does improve outcomes, and that's what we're all about. So we, these uh, are the core characteristics that we teach our students and our residents and our family doctors. And there's some very um, other important issues that the, the family physicians and the pediatricians and the physiotherapists and chiropractors should be aware of. So they should be asking about aspects of the family history, uh, the presence of arthritis in other joints other than the spine, and these are what we call extra-articular features. So about, as I mentioned, about 30% of our patients have inflammation in the eye, 10% of our patients have psoriasis, and 10% of our patients have inflammatory bowel disease like uh, Crohn's disease. So it's very important that we communicate to our medical students, our residents, our family practitioners, that they be alert with a high index of suspicion when they see a young patient with long, uh, long-standing back pain that's unexplained. Now, as you know, the x-ray of the pelvis, the, so the sacroiliac joint, everybody in this room is very familiar with where, where that is, um, basically just links the spine to the pelvis. It's a non-moving uh, joint, and it stabilizes the pelvis with the spine. This is the initial uh, onset of inflammation in the large percentage of patients with agonistic spine virus. We still don't really understand why that's the target joint, but it's very distinctive. And <laughs> under normal circumstances, this is a very smooth uh, line in a normal joint, but it, when, in the setting of chronic, chronic inflammation, that smooth surface is, re is replaced by uh, erosions and damage to the cartilage and to the bony structures. And that's used uh, uh, as a very important early diagnostic tool in the de detection of ankylosing spondylitis. As, that, as the disease advances and involves more of the spine, of course, you get the, the normal uh, concavity that sits at the front of the vertebral bodies is lost. That's what we call square. And most distinctively is the presence of these bone spurs these bone spurs that bridge the vertebral bodies in the spine. Now, the spine is actually a beautiful structure because all these intervertebral discs are structured to, to bear weight and allow uh, forward side and back flexion uh, of the spine. These uh, bony bridges that exist between the vertebral bodies really restrict that, and that leads to significant uh, flexibility in the spine over time. This would be a, a, a warning sign to an ophthalmologist. If an ophthalmologist saw a young patient with back pain and saw inflammation in the eye like that, that patient should be referred promptly down to our spondylitis clinic because we can work with the ophthalmologist in improving outcomes, not just of the eye inflammation, but the arthritis as well. And again, uh, peripheral joints like Achilles tendonitis or heel pain, uh, plantar fasciitis, <clears throat> should be a warning sign to our primary care doctors that something else is going on. And we'd like to keep reminding our, our students and our, our family physicians to be alert to that possibility. So this is a challenge as we talk to our family physicians in our education training, but uh, to give them a simple structure of uh, an approach to patients with uh, low back pain that would allow us to capture these uh, and recognize these patients much more efficiently. Uh, and frequently the delay really exists in this uh, area uh, once the, if the family physician is alert to the possibility of spondylitis, he'll, he can uh, proceed to a simple x-ray and two simple blood tests that will actually improve the diagnostic the capture rate of this. So this is an ongoing challenge for us. Our goal, as Michael said, is to move that long interval of six or seven years back to uh, six months. And we would like to see patients uh, on effective treatment within the first year of the disease. That's a, uh, that's a dream we all share in the program. Now, can we do better in making the diagnosis earlier? So the x-ray that I showed you, which has these distinctive changes in the sacroiliac joint, actually takes many months and possibly years in, in some patients to develop. So if the, even if the, if the primary care physician sees a young person with chronic back pain and does an x-ray of the sacroiliac joints and they're normal, the disease still could be pro present because it's occurring, we're seeing the patient earlier in the disease process, so what's called pre-radiographic stage. So before the x-ray changes are present, uh, the, the inflammation is there, and certainly the patients are very symptomatic. 
In fact, we know that the burden of the illness back here, in terms of quality of life, uh, pain measures, sleep indicators, is just as severe here as it is <coughs> in the more uh, established disease. So how can we actually get a handle on that patient population more effectively? And this has made a big difference. So the advent of magnetic resonance in imaging has really made a significant contribution to earlier diagnosis. Here's a patient who has normal x-rays on the sacroiliac joints. But in an MRI image, uh, this white, these white spots right here represent inflammation. And it's inflammation adjacent to the sacroiliac joint. And a, a part of our uh, uh, education goal in working with uh, rheumatologists and family doctors in Ontario is to, to make sure that we have trained our radiologists and, as well as our rheumatologists to recognize these lesions early on. Because the test actually has to be specifically ordered in a specific way, and the ordering physician has to request a particular sequence saying, is there evidence of inflammation that is compatible with ankylosis spondylitis? So this is a big advance. We are now in a position to more confidently diagnose ankylosis spondylitis much earlier than we could. And the challenge now is, is implement that. It's really operationalizing this technique so it goes across the, the province and across Canada. So just a couple of words on the genetic aspects of this disease. And this, I'm sure, will come up in our <coughs> question. And these are two twins uh, uh, from uh, the Philippines in our clinic. Um, they are both HLA-B27 positive. They are, both have had their right hip replaced surgically. And uh, their x-rays have exactly the same bony bridges at every level. So if you knew nothing about, even if you were a skeptic about genetics, if you saw two twins walk into the clinic like that, you might suspect that genetics have an important uh, role in this disease. Now, we know that uh, uh, B27, HLA B27, which is a normal gene in, the, in about 7% of the population, is present in about 90% of patients with ankylosing spondylitis. Now, it's interesting, wherever in the globe where the HLA B27 occurs with greater frequency, ankylosing spondylitis correspondingly occurs with greater frequency. So in populations, uh, for example, uh, in Australia, where B27 is absent, we see essentially no ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, it's about 1% in Japan. Uh, in Western Europe and North America, it's about 8%. And interestingly enough, in the West Coast tribes of Canada, uh, the Bellacool and the Haida, there's a very high frequency of HLA-B27 uh, in that population. So this actually stimulates, from the point of view of population genetics, this has stimulated a, lo a large research community around the globe about what does this mean when we think about the human genetic makeup and we see a, a distribution like this on a global scale, what does that suggest? The other important advance, uh, and this represents a very uh, international collaborative study. So the genetic, the power of genetic studies really lies in numbers. And to do uh, what we call adequately powered studies that have enough patients to make a firm conclusion uh, requires not dozens or hundreds, but actually thousands of patients. So this actually, this plot represents not only the Canadian spondylitis patients, but uh, uh, Australia, uh, British, and American. And um, each of these dots represents a, a gene. And the, the height of the vertical axis here is the likelihood that that gene is associated with ankylosing spondylitis. Um, so there are a couple of interesting, very new, new genes. This is the IL-23 receptor. This is a gene called ERAP that we're studying actively at the Western. But the recognition, this long, tall vertical axis here is, is HLA-B27, which was recognized in 1973 to be associated with uh, uh, ankylosing spondylitis. And it, it remains the strongest genetic association. So uh, there's this big, tall peak of HLA-B27 that sets the stage. And, and in fact, Spondylitis researchers, no matter what they look at, they have this in their mind. So, for example, this is the um, this is the skyline of Toronto from a, from a, a researcher in ankylosing spondylitis perspective. We see this big HLA uh, peak sticking up from uh, Toronto. What about environmental factors? And this is a because the genetic aspect of the disease is something we inherit. We're not about even in the uh, the, the uh, age of gene therapy to alter the genetic makeup of individuals. But it does provide us insights into possible new drug therapy interventions. But either, what about the role for environmental factors? Because um, the presence of those two identical twins that have 
spondylitis, uh, there are also examples where twins are discordant, where they, 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 despite their gen common genetic makeup. So we know that genetic factors are, put on, are very important. B27 is perhaps the dominant genetic factor, but there are at least seven or eight other genes that are contributing actively to ankylosing spondylitis. Um, the, the big question that we've been interested in and remains a very, uh, as, as yet unresolved, is to what extent the interaction of genetic background and some kind of environmental factor plays an important role. Uh, and um, this is a, a very, it's a key issue that we're uh, actively pursuing at the moment.